Good afternoon and welcome to today's lunch hour lecture. Um, our lecturer is Dr. Helen Wilson in mathematics and she will be talking about from gases to gloops, instabilities in fluids. Dr. Um, Wilson has been at University College since 2004. Before that, she was educated in Cambridge for her first two degrees and spent some time um, in America at the University of um, Boulder in Colorado. Um, and um, she may not have time for questions, but if she does, she'd be happy to take them. Dr. Wilson. Right, without further ado, and hopefully without further technical mess up. What is an instability? I'm going to spend all of this time talking about a variety of different instabilities. What I mean by an instability is something that, in some sense, goes wrong. So what you see here is a chunk of polymer being extruded to make a plastic strip. It, there are actually two layers being extruded together, and they're supposed to be bound together to produce a two-layer strip of some use that I can't remember. But as you can see, there are ripples. These ripples are not as it looks on the top. They're actually on the interface in between the two layers. They're inside the strip, but they obviously impair the optical quality, and they're not a good thing. Sometimes instabilities are a good thing. So if you're trying to mix, an instability can be a good way to get that to happen. But most, most applications tend to focus on trying to postpone or avoid instabilities. So now I want to run through a few of the standard instabilities that there are. The first one being plateau Rayleigh. And this one is the thing that causes a dripping tap not to just be a thin, slender filament. So if there were no instability, a column of fluid would just flow, getting thinner as it accelerates, because there's only so much fluid to go round. But what we see instead is that it tapers in places and breaks off. So let me explain how this works. Take a cylinder, because this works for cylinders that aren't accelerating under gravity as well. Take a cylinder of fluid and perturb the surface. So apply a little wave to the surface. Now the regions where you've made it narrower have a high curvature, which means that the surface tension pulling them inwards is stronger there. And the regions where you've made it larger have a lower curvature, which means the surface tension total pulling inwards is less there, which tends to enhance the instability. It's actually not quite as simple as that because there's a curvature in the other direction which acts in the other direction. And the competition between those two things causes there to be a specific wavelength that is the most unstable, and that is the Rayleigh wavelength. So, Plateau and Rayleigh. That's Joseph Plateau. He was Belgian, which I think qualifies him as a famous Belgian. Um, and he was surprisingly wide-ranging in his interests. So he did an awful lot of work on vision, and he created this thing called the Phenakistoscope, which was a very early pioneer of the beginnings of cinema. You look through a slit, and changing images went past you on a reel, um, and you got the illusion of motion from that. And he created the first one of those. But he's mostly remembered for his work on soap films and the surface tension in general, which is where the Rayleigh Plateau instability came, that comes in. The borders between soap um, films in a foam are called plateau borders. And this is one of those examples of people whose name seems to drive what they do, because you think it's a plateau border because everything's a nice flat plateau. But no, it's named after Joseph Plateau. What about Rayleigh? Well, he was an absolutely archetypal um, natural scientist in the very, very broadest sense. He studied all sorts of different things. Um, he got the Nobel Prize for discovering argon at the same time as doing all this stuff on fluid mechanics. And that's not half of it. There's, I mean, he just was everywhere. Right, let's have another instability. Rayleigh-Taylor. This is probably the simplest mechanism of instability you could possibly imagine. If you put a layer of heavy stuff over a layer of light stuff, then what you would expect to happen happens. 
heavy stuff wants to get down to the bottom, the light stuff wants to get up to the top. Any wavelength of perturbation that you put on to the interface between the two will be unstable. And so you see this hugely messy, complex pattern where the light white material at the bottom <coughs> is penetrating at every, every length scale into the heavy material at the top. And the mechanism, as I said, is just gravity. So Rayleigh, yeah, it's him again. And Taylor, G.I. Taylor, um, much more recent. He was the grandson of George Bull, which is a little known fact about him. Um, again, pretty wide ranging, and for somebody so recent, impressively wide ranging. So he did a lot in fluid mechanics, including be a being a pioneer of turbulence, turbulence. But he was also one of the first to demonstrate that in photon slit experiments, you could see the diffraction fringes even when the average density was less than one photon at a time. He was invited to be present and was pre present at the Trinity nuclear test. And afterwards, working from photographs that were published in a magazine, he back-engineered the yield and published it, which was not very popular because it was classified. Right, here's another instability. These are Taylor vortices. So what you're seeing here is a vertical cell cylindrical, with another cylinder inside it, and the inner cylinder is rotating. It's designed, it's called a taylor Cuet cell, it's designed to measure the viscosity of the material in between the two cylinders. You measure the, the torque needed to rotate the inner cylinder, and that tells you about the viscosity of the material in between. Cuet designed it with an immensely precise instrument to actually measure the viscosity of air. But this one has a slightly fatter gap, slightly less precise, because it's designed to show you what happens if you flow it too fast. So up to a certain speed, everything is nice and uniform. And then above a certain speed, these rolls kick in. And they're caused by a coupling between the inertia, which makes the fluid in the middle want to go to the outside, and the curvature. So of course, that's Taylor again. Now, this is probably the most beautiful instability of the lot called Kelvin Helmholtz, and this amazing photograph is a real cloud. If you have a dense fluid with a lighter fluid above it, so now we don't have the density-driven instability, but they are flowing at different speeds. So I'm doing this, but actually they can be both going the same way with one going faster than the other, and it still works. Then on the interface between these two streams, you have the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability, which has a very specific wavelength that is chosen and forms these very characteristic roll shapes when it happens. Uh, Kelvin, to be honest, I look at that picture and I just think, wow, what a beard. Um, most of his work was on thermodynamics. So obviously, the, the unit of heat, the Kelvin, is named after him. Um, to be fair, Joule was pretty involved, and he got something named after him as well, didn't he? Um, <laughs> but it's not all about fluid mechanics. These are still very, very wide-ranging people. Um, and Helmholtz, who forewent the beard and just stuck with the moustache, um, who did an awful lot on biological systems, physical systems. So he, did, he pretty much came up with the principle of conservation of energy from studying muscles and the fact that you could get back the work you'd put into your muscles and you don't get tired as fast as if you were using all of that energy every time. Um, and he was also fascinated by vision and how we perceive color. He did a lot on the maths of how we perceive color, as well as this fluid stuff. Right, and then the last instability I'm going to show you for now is the Safman-Taylor instability. Now, this is hated by the oil industry because what it is, is if you put a less viscous fluid behind a more viscous fluid, so something thin behind something thick, say, just to pick a random example, water behind oil, and you try to push the oil out of the way with the water, it doesn't work. The water, the interface is unstable, and the water forms a finger and breaks through. So if you just put plain water down an oil well to push out the oil, what you get back is very slightly dirty water. And here's a picture of it. Absolutely beautiful. What you're seeing here is a black, not, not very viscous fluid being injected 
into a white viscous fluid. If it was the other way around, if the black one was more viscous, you'd just see a series of circles, each bigger than the one before. But it forms these fingers, and then every time you start to get a nice flat front, that's unstable as well, so it forms fingers. And so these are self-similar fractal patterns. Philip Sapferman, uh, most recent of all the people I'm putting up here, um, actually came from Leeds, although he worked most of his career at Caltech. Um, now we're starting to see the more mo modern trend where you don't actually cover all of science in your career, but he still managed to cover all of fluid mechanics, which is pretty amazing. So he worked on turbulence, <coughs> tiny particles, smoke rings or vortex rings. His work on the trailing vortices be behind aircraft actually caused the international standard for how soon an aircraft can take off after the one before it to be changed and to be lengthened. So he had really serious impact. And, of course, Taylor again. Right, that's enough of the overview of instabilities. Now, I want to show you how we will calculate these things. I'm not going to go into this in huge detail. If you get lost in this slide, don't worry, it will come back. But what I use almost all of the time is linear stability theory. And the basic principle is you start from the solution that you would like to happen, the nice, smooth solution. And you start by calculating that. If you're lucky, you calculate it with pen and paper. If you're unlucky, you even have to do that bit computationally, but you do it by whatever method. And then, in theory, you say, well, what if there's a small change? I'll add a small bit to it. And then I will throw that through all of my governing equations and throw away everything that is the size of the small thing squared. What I'm left with is a linear system, and that means we have a lot of extra mass at our disposal, we can do some Fourier transforms to make things nice and tidy it up. But essentially, what we end up with is that this system is a linear system and it may have eigenvalues. It will have eigenvalues. When we find the eigenvalues, they tell us about the stability of the system. So I will be talking from now on about this eigenvalue omega, whose imaginary part is positive if the little wiggle I've put on is growing in time. If the imaginary part is negative, then it will decay in time, and so I say that my system's stable. So the assumptions underlying linear stability theory are that you've got smooth equations, so doing linearization can work at all. It also assumes that your fluid model is not just good at catching steady state behavior, but also transient behavior, because you're looking at changes in time, this sort of thing. Um, the strengths of it are that it's actually quite relatively easy to do. And if you find an instability, you've properly found an instability. So it doesn't give false positives. If you find an instability, it really is there. And it's because it's sufficiently simple, you may be able to reduce to systems that are straightforward enough that you can actually see which physical term is causing what and understand what's going on. Weaknesses. It only tells you whether it's unstable or not. It doesn't tell you what's going to happen next. So you may think you found something terribly exciting, and then you go and simulate, and you find that actually it just forms a little ripple and then stabilizes at a finite amplitude and carries on for the rest of time as a small ripple, which is not very exciting. Or it might move to a different steady state, or it might go turbulent. You just have no idea. And also, there are some instabilities which just can't be caught with linear stability theory, and there's nothing you can do about it. Right, now I want to start talking about non-Newtonian fluids because that's what I work on. And specifically for today, polymer solutions. So a polymer solution, what I'm imagining is something where there are not very many of these polymer molecules. I mean, obviously, there are very many, but by volume, they are isolated from one another. They can each be treated as an isolated object in a vat of solvent. So left to itself, in the absence of flow, this little polymer thing will form a coil, an entropic coil, moving around under Brownian motion, which is on average roughly spherical. And then, if you apply a flow to it, it will deform with the flow, affinely, and then relax using the Brownian motion and the entropy. Um, and the fact that it has this shape gives the whole fluid a memory of what flow you have put it through in a way that fluid doesn't usually have. And we can model this 
the simplest possible way to model it is to say, well, what's the simplest thing that can do a deformation and recover? And the answer is something that's got two ends and a spring to pull them back together. So we have two beads, which are not real beads. All they do is feel the fluid pulling them. They don't interact with each other or anything like that. And a spring with a relaxation time trying to pull them back together, which comes from the Brownian motion. And that gives us these equations, which I'm not going to go into in great depth. But the red things, G and Tor, are my parameters. G is the strength of the spring. Tor is the relaxation time of the spring. Uh, and that model is called the upper convective Maxwell model. It's been around since 1950 or possibly even earlier. And the dimensionless number that we will need to characterize flow rate, we make flow rates dimensionless using the relaxation time. And the thing that comes out of that is the Weissenberg number. Now, the Weissenberg number can be understood by what it does in its, in its extremes. The Weissenberg number is very large. That means that the deformation is very fast, whereas u is very small, very large, or the time scale is the time scale of the polymer is very long. In other words, it takes it a long time to relax. So either way, this conformation stays in for a long time. It doesn't relax out. So we get behavior that's rather like an elastic solid. In the other extreme, if the Weissenberg number is very small, it's either a very slow flow or a very quick relaxing polymer. So whatever you do to it, it goes back to being a sphere pretty quickly, and you get just fluid-like behavior. So having talked about the Weissenberg number, I ought to tell you about Weissenberg. Um, he was the first real rheologist. Now, rheology is the study of weirdy fluids, essentially. Um, and Weissenberg was a pioneer. He has the Weissenberg number named after him. He invented an artificial silk that was stronger than real silk, just based on his polymer studies. But perhaps more interesting to us is the Weissenberg effect, which I'm going to come back to in a sec. So now, this is the second slide of equations. Don't get too scared. I want to show you what the UCM model does if you stick it in a shear flow. Now, a shear flow is this, or this. It, I can't do it further than that. But it's the simplest experimentally realizable flow that you can measure fluid behavior with. So it's done a lot for measuring your fluids. So you impose a flow like this, and what happens to the little polymer blob is that it gets stretched out diagonally. And so you end up with these stresses in the one, two element of the matrix, which are just the viscosity times the shear rate. The shear rate, the rate at which you're doing this flow, is called gamma dot. The number in front of it, the G tor, that's a constant. So what you're seeing there is that this fluid model has a constant shear viscosity. And then the other thing to notice is the difference between the other two terms, which is positive. What that tells us is that it feels as if a streamline of the flow has a tension in it. It's as if these little polymers stretched out along it are actually lining up along the streamlines and wanting to pull back. So it's as if you have elastic strings along all of your streamlines. And what that can do for us in a rotating flow where the streamlines are circles is that these circles want to pull inwards. And this all sounds completely made up, but that's a real experiment. If you take a sufficiently entangled polymer solution and stir it with a rotating rod, it will climb the rod. And that is the Weissenberg effect. Right, now I want to actually talk about an instability in these non-Newtonian fluids, because that was the point of introducing them. So, we were just talking about this tension in the streamlines, like an elastic stress along the, along the streamlines. This is a channel flow, left to right, um, of three layers, but actually the top one's the same as the bottom one. So think of it as being an elastic layer on the outside and the both sides of the outside, and something not so elastic in the middle. Say you've got a molten plastic with oil flowing through the middle in some processing flow. So now I take my interface and I apply a perturbation to it because I'm going to do my linear stability thing. And I look at one of those slopey regions. And I say, what's going to happen there? Because I've got a jump in the tension along the streamlines, which are broadly speaking horizontal. I've got a jump in tension there. That's going to pull 
each of those sloping regions in the direction of the arrow. And now I've got these four red arrows, and indeed over here at the other end where I haven't drawn them, there'll be more red arrows doing the same things again. My fluid wants to follow the arrows, but to make it actually get there, just to conserve the amount of fluid we've got, the only way it can do it is to form vortices that do this here, this here, clockwise on the left, anti-clockwise on the right, which then cause a net flow down the right, up in the middle, which makes that tiny perturbation that I put on get bigger. And that's the mechanism for a purely elastic interfacial instability. Now, I talked about the UCM model, and it's not bad in shear flows for many things, but one thing that it does really get quite badly wrong is the fact that it has a constant shear viscosity. This is a typical plot of what a real polymer solution do does at different shear rates. At high shear rates, its viscosity is much lower than it is at low shear rates. These are log-log plots. This is a massive, massive reduction of viscosity as you increase the shear rate. So, what can we do to our model? Well, in a slightly hand-wavy empirical way, we can say it's got a couple of constants in it. So, let's just let our constants depend on the shear rate. And then I can turn down my viscosity as a function of shear rate. And I can basically shove in the experimental measured viscosity. And yeah, it's a bit fudgy, but I can get something that joins up to the normal theory and still works. And this is called the white Metzner model. So cue two more scientists. As far as I can tell, there is only one picture of James White on the internet, I'm afraid. Um, I don't know a whole lot about him, except that he was very into rubber. Metzner, on the other hand, I know lots about. Um, he was a core figure of the Society of Rheology, which is the American equivalent of the British Society of Rheology, which I'm a member of. Um, he received its Bingham Medal in 1977, and after he died, they made a new medal in his honor, which they've awarded each year since 2009. Right, so now let's come into what I have done. So my very first research project was to take that interfacial instability that you've just seen and try and extend it. And one of the ways I tried to extend it, one of the ways I did extend it, was to look at what happened if the interface was not sharp. And as soon as you ask that question, you go, well, what, what do I mean by the interface? What do I mean by, how do I know what the fluid properties are if they're not gonna be just one thing here and another thing here? And I found two different ways of looking at that. I'd started from two layers of clearly distinct fluids just being piped in as if they'd just come from two different supplies. I change that, and I say, okay, well, let's stick with that idea that each bit of fluid with a different property has come from a different source. And so I idealize to an infinite array of nozzles, each with a different height, each with a different property, and a gradual variation across the channel. Or on the other hand, I could say, well, Maybe the fluid's property depends on its shear rate because the shear rate varies across the channel. So I can just make it respond instantaneously to whatever shear rate it finds itself at. And I can clearly model the base flow, the steady flow, using either of those methods. And I do, and I match the two, as you can see here. And then I look at their stability properties. And this looks like one graph, but that was probably a year's work. This is the big result that the instability modes, the values of omega, for those two different ways of looking at it, they look pretty similar down the bottom. So I've clearly got something right in the way these fluids respond. But that little blue line at the top is an instability. And it only happens when the fluid can remember its properties when it moves around. In other words, in the lots of little nozzles model. It doesn't happen if it all depends on shear rate. It just isn't there at all. Now, that was really an aside because, oh, I've forgotten this slide. <laughs> so what I'm doing, just, just to kind of give you the picture, I don't have a systematic way of finding an eigenvalue when I've got my problem set up. What I do is I find one by hook or by crook, and then when I've got one, I change my parameters just a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and keep on tracking it through parameter space. So that does mean that if I don't find an instability, it doesn't mean there isn't one. Just means I wasn't looking in the right place. But if I found one, I found one. That's 
that's fine. Right, so, having introduced this fluid properties depending on shear rate setup, purely to do the interfacial thing, I then had it all coded, and it would seem silly not to go looking around. So I had a look around in the white the model, and I found a new instability that nobody had seen before. With a simple power law, so I let both, I, I let the time scale depend on the shear rate as a power law, but I left my um, strength of spring constant. And there is an issue with this, that the shear viscosity blows up on the center line. Where the shear rate is zero, the shear stress, the product of the, the off-diagonal bit, doesn't quite go to zero fast enough. So you've got a singularity there, which means things go wrong in the middle of the channel. But as long as you stay away from the middle of the channel, that's not too serious. And I found this instability. And this is a slide from my thesis. And as you can see, there's quite a lot going on here. Now, this is a graph of the growth rate plotted against the power law index. So over here, n equals 1, this is a not a shear thinning fluid. This is a well understood fluid. And over here, this is a very shear thinning fluid. When any line goes above the imaginary part of omega equals 0 line, that's an instability. So you can see that below about 0.3, there's quite a lot of it going on. And for very low n, there's, there's tons of different instabilities. Uh, so in summary, at n equals 1, somebody actually did this properly, theoretically, because it's accessible a long time before I came along. We know all possible values of omega, and they're all stable, and it's all dull. All the way down to 0.3, I didn't find anything. Doesn't mean it's not there, but I didn't find anything. And then below 0.3, instability starts to kick in. And if you get down to 0.1, there's loads of these things. It's a zoo. So, 1999, with my supervisor, we published this, asking the question, is the instability in channel flow that we have found theoretically observed in practice? And it went quiet for 14 years until I got this email saying, our fluid is highly shear thinning and the flow becomes unstable. Do you think this could be your instability? I never thought this was going to happen. If you, if you stick an instability out there and nothing happens for over a decade, you don't think it's going to be found. You just think, oh, well, you know, it was a theoretical nicety, but obviously it's not real. Never mind. But it turns out I wasn't just playing with equations. There really is something going on here. So this French group, um, led by Hugues Bodiguel and Annie Collin, have been working with a tiny, tiny channel. It's only five centimeters long, and it's much, much less wide and deep than that, with a polymer solution. And what have they seen? For a start, this is the prediction, the theoretical prediction of what the velocity should be on the center line. Up to a certain, they're measuring in terms of wall shear stress, but you can think of it as flow rate. Up to a certain flow rate, the theory and the experiments lie on top of each other. And then beyond that, theory, that specific flow rate, it just doesn't match anymore. If they plot how much noise they're getting in their measurements, against wall shear stress, against flow rate. Again, it's not much, not much. I mean, clearly there's some, right? This is a real experiment. It's going to have some noise. But the ma magnitude of the fluctuations jumps massively at a very specific wall shear stress. And finally, you can actually see it. You put tracer particles in, and you look down from on top, and you can see the path lines wiggling from side to side. So they're seeing oscillations, they're seeing transient flows, they're seeing a very poor fit of the steady theory to the experimental observations, which means there is an instability. So can I model it? Well, this is their rheometry, which means this is what they get when they stick their fluid in the equivalent of that taylor Couette device, or actually they do it in a different one called a conan plate. And they measure these things, and they stick a straight line through them, which is marginally dubious, but does make the theory much, much easier to work with. And when they do that, I can fit it with my model. 
more or less. So I go back to my empirically modified version of UCM. And if I choose my shear viscosity G tor to shear thin with a power law M and my time scale to shear thin with a power law N, then I can match their fluid. Uh, the case M equals N, I've studied before, but the rest of this is going to be new. So I don't know the answers yet, but in the experiments, the M is 0.2-ish, the N is 0.4-ish. And you can define a Weissenberg number based on the, you can no longer use just a time scale, which is what we'd like, because the time scale varies depending on your shear rate. So you use the average shear rate and the time scale based on the average shear rate for that. And the critical flow rate for instability observed in the experiments is about two and three quarters. Now, in my old theory where m equals n, if I take a value of 0.4-ish, I do not get an instability. But if I take a value of 0.2-ish, I do get an instability, and the critical flow rate for it is not too far off. So it's looking hopeful. So my first thought was, this doesn't look too hard. I'll just calculate a new governing equation, stick it into the code I've still got, and just move away from n equals n by very small steps, right? Didn't work. I could take a step of order 10 to the minus 8 from a solution that worked fine and not be able to find a new solution. It's very frustrating. So the second thought was, let's get somebody else to do it. I found an MSE student. This is Vivian. Um, and he took it over. And he was very good. So in order to make it a good project for him, I didn't just hand him my equations and say, go. I gave him the modeling bit, because it's an MSE in mathematical modeling, to do first, which was very good for his project. He clearly understood what he was doing. It was all fully developed. But he did choose the opposite conventions for M and N from me, and one of them had a plus one in, which caused all sorts of disasters later on. But having got past that, he was really good at coding. He had absolutely no trouble finding an instability, and he basically sorted it all out. And so here is the summary of what he managed. So in the experiments, we've seen we had a critical Weissenberg number of two and three quarters. I didn't tell you, but it had been observed that the period of oscillation was just over a second. And you could see in those plots of the path lines that there were cross-channel oscillations. That's really all you can extract from the experiments, just one, essentially one data point. And then we tried to mimic the same data point. We found a critical flow rate of 1.8. It's a bit low, but it's not miles off, given how many other approximations we've got. The period of oscillation is beautiful, and to be honest, has to be a bit of a fluke. The mode of instability is clearly wrong. Remember I said that the viscosity was going to go singular at the center line. That means that we can't actually do anything your channels like this, we can't have a perturbation that goes up and down at the center line. We can only do this. And that's clearly not what's seen in the experiments. And that's a weakness of that straight line that was put through the experimental data. That straight line does not go on all the way to zero. So, in a similar story to what I was talking about earlier, got it coded out. It would be churlish not to go and see what else is going on. So let's have a little look around the parameter space. Looking first at what's the minimum flow rate for it to go unstable at any given set of parameters. So in this case, I'm not fixing a wavelength. I'm saying for all wavelengths, when it first goes unstable, what's the lowest flow rate for that? So all I need to fix is M. Everything else is free to move. And you can see that there's something a bit odd going on at M and N, both being 0.2. I'll come back to that later, but it's going to be a bit of a theme. But also, and this is just pure coincidence, there's a minimum, in other words, a most dangerous, most unstable place, when M is 0.2 and N is 0.4, i.e. exactly where the experiments happen to fall. There's no reason for that. That's just what their fluid happens to do. They were just lucky enough to choose one that goes unstable pretty early. Uh, the critical wavelength is always about the size of the channel, so you get sort of whole channel rolls going on this thing. Right, what else can we look at? Yes, varying M. So in the last one I had M fixed at 0.2. Now I'm allowing M to vary and I'm fixing N, the other power law. 
um, at 0.1, that's the blue one, 0.2, the red one, 0.3, sorry, 0.2, the black one, 0.3, the red one. And you can see there is instability everywhere. It's above zero, remember, it's un unstable. There's instability for low M, and it stabilizes over here. You might also notice that there's a little notch in the blue curve at 0.1. There's a less visible, and so I will zoom in on it, notch in the black curve at 0.2 here. And it's the same in all of them. If I fix N, then there is a notch where M equals N when I'm plotting against M. So there's something weird going on, and I haven't got to the bottom of what it is, when N, N equals M. But this does at least explain why my first try at the parameter continuation wasn't going to help. There's some other odd behavior in this black curve. Here's a bit. It's not quite so exciting because these numbers you probably can't see, but they're negative. So it's stable here. So we're not talking about an instability anymore. We're just talking about a mathematical nicety. But I was plotting my route, and suddenly it's not there anymore, and it leaps. And you cannot join those two ends together. It's just the way it is. And then finally, my final piece of weirdness, I was plotting. Remember, I just keep on changing my parameters a little bit and seeing if I can find the next route. I was plotting, and I got that. And I thought, oh, great. I found a new route. I'll be able to go from that point and track back in space and see if I can find a new instability of that. So I zoomed in, and I got that. My new route is just a wiggle. And it's an extremely complicated wiggle, which I will now show you. So on the right, you have the plot we've just seen. This is growth rate, positive when it's above zero, negative growth rate, meaning rate of decay, when it's below zero, plotted against M, and then on the left, you may remember that omega was, in fact, a complex eigenvalue. So I'm plotting its whole value in the complex plane and watching how it moves as I change m. So as I increase m, at the moment I'm stable, and I become unstable, you'll think in this graph, there are some weird things going on, right? One, two, three, four. We'll cover them in order. So the first one, it's a cut, right? But actually, if you look at the graph, on the, the graph on the right, what we've just been through is nothing other than a gentle minimum in the growth rate. So that's not actually weird. It looks weird, but it's not weird. It's fine. Physically, we understand what's going on there. This next one, that little cusp there, that corresponds with the dot at 0.2. So that is the m equals n thing. There's something weird. We don't know what it is. Then the next one, is the discontinuity. Well, you, you'll see that the, in the complex plane, it actually curls back on itself and then curls in again. There's no way those two ends are going to join together. And finally, the weirdest of all, that blip, as I go up and down the blip, my little blob actually goes round the circle and then carries on. It looks like it's not a graph at all. It looks like I've just stamped a circle over my line. But actually, it comes down, it goes round, and it goes off again. So in summary, fluid instabilities are everywhere. They're beautiful. Some of them are very understood. Some of the mechanisms are lovely and simple. Some of them are complex, but still well understood. And as soon as you throw in viscoelasticity, you get new instabilities, and you get all sorts of weirdness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we don't really have time for any questions. Um, we have about 30 seconds, and I think we have to leave. So thank you very much. I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking Helen once more for her lecture. <laughs>